faces back here. Because I'm a visitor. Sometimes I welcome someone and they say, no, we're members. Okay. <laughs> This quarter we're studying the book of Galatians, and uh, today we're going to spend uh, the last day on Galatians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1. Let's begin by looking at Galatians chapter 1, and I would like for you to share with us, if you have a subheading between verses 10 and 11, subheading between verses 10 and 11. Would you volunteer to audibleize and read it for us? The genuineness of his conversion to Christianity. Everyone hear that? The genuineness of the conversion, of his conversion to Christianity. Anyone else have a subheading over here? Call to apostleship. Call to apostleship over here? Okay. Is that it? Grace through faith. I'm sorry? By grace through faith. By grace through faith. Mine says the revelation of Jesus Christ. A revelation of Jesus Christ. This is between 1 and 2. Verses, between verses 10 and 11 of Galatians chapter 1. Mine says uh, Paul defends his ministry. Why would it be necessary for Paul to defend his ministry? <coughs> he was an original apostle that walked with Jesus. Weren't the Ephesians the people trying to interject other gospels into the Ephesians? Ephesians? Other teachings Galatians. into the Galatians? Galatians. 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 When I study my Bible, I uh, look up the text and I have a concordance next to me. And I look up key words. The next thing I do is I look at uh, the comments of one of the founders of our church and see what this person's comments are on particular verses. I would like to paraphrase for you Ellen White's comments on Galatians chapter 1. In almost every church that Paul and Barnabas or Silas visited, they always went to the Jewish synagogues. Let's look up Acts 13. Acts chapter 13. And uh, a volunteer to read... Uh, Verses 5, 14, 42, 44. Acts chapter 13. Who would like to read verse 5 for us? Let it read. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. So the first thing that Paul did was what? Where? Of the who? Jews. Yes. How about verse 14? Who would like to read verse 14 for us? Anyone? Over here. 14 of chapter 13 of Acts. But when they departed from Carla, they came to Antioch in Syria and went into the synagogue on Sabbath day and sat down. Okay, we all know that Paul was called by Jesus to minister to whom? The Gentiles. But he still had a burden for whom? His people. You can read it for yourself in Romans 9, verse 3. It says, if it would help, if it were possible, if it would contribute to my people being saved, take my life. Amen. That's commitment. Okay, how about verse 44, 42 and 44 of the same chapter, Acts 13. Anyway, over here, Tom. And as Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these... 42 and 44. 13. Chapter 13 of Acts. And as Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. Now when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, 
many of the Jews and of the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. Okay. Again, there's a clear pattern here that Paul is always reaching out to whom first? The Jews. Okay. Very important. Now, wherever Paul <coughs> visited, he not only visited the synagogues, and <coughs> the, but the churches that he actually raised, there were not only Gentiles there, but there were Jews. Now, it's important for us to understand the wording here. Where does Israel come from? What is their race? The Hebrew race. And they're the nation of Israel. Okay? And some of them, most of them, were of the Jewish faith. Clear distinction there, because even the Jews, the religious leaders, had a very special name for those Jews that had not been converted to Judaism. They called them sinners. So... <clears throat> These Jewish teachers move into these churches following Paul and they discredit Paul's ministry and his presentation of the gospel. Among the Jewish converts to Christianity, they found, they found a very receptive audience. And so they said to them, <clears throat> Paul is not a credible apostle. Because like someone mentioned earlier, he was not of the original disciples. So Jesus did not specifically commission Paul to be a disciple or to be an apostle. The next thing that they said to them was that Paul's ministry is a contradiction, a contradiction of the message that Jesus' trained disciples were preaching. <laughs> so the strategy was to alienate, beginning with the converted Jews to Christianity, create a doubt in their mind about the credibility of the one that had taught them the gospel, Paul, and that what he was teaching them was not what Jesus' disciples were teaching, as if they really cared. This strategy succeeded. These Jewish teachers convinced the converted Jews to Christianity that they needed to return to the observance of the ceremonial law as essential for their salvation. And that included what? Circumcision. Which meant that faith in Christ and observance of the moral law was secondary in importance. This resulted in a division and heresy working itself into these churches that Paul and his other companions had raised. So that's the background to our study of Galatians. And that's Ellen White's comments regarding chapter 1 of Galatians, which we will conclude today. How many of you are parents? Good. I am too. After your children leave home and they begin their lives, you hear, you learn, that they are being taught that one of the ways to experience the ultimate high in life, physically and emotional, emotionally, is to start taking drugs. If you heard that about your children, what would you do? Huh? I might even scold them. These converts to Christianity in the Galatian churches are Paul's spiritual children. So Paul's soul is stirred when he gets reports of what these converts to Christianity are doing. So he writes a letter. 
which is the letter that we're studying in this quarter. And the purpose of this letter is to expose the lies that the people have been taught and rebuke those that have departed from the faith. Let's take a look at verses 11 and 12 of Galatians chapter 1. Who would like to volunteer to read verses 11 and 12 of Galatians chapter 1? Over here, Carl. Thank you. Everyone there? But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through, through the revelation of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Thank you. So, is the gospel divine? Yes. If the gospel is divine, then what is it not? Who said human? Not human. It is not human. It's one or the other. Let's take a look at verse 1 of Galatians chapter 1. Who would like to read that for us? Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. Thank you. However, by birth and education, Paul had been taught to be opposed 100% to everything that had to do with the gospel or Christianity. We already read Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 21, where we learned that it took a blinding light from heaven and Jesus' audible voice to convert Paul to Christianity. How many of you had that dramatic conversion to Christianity? The effect, however, and the reality of our conversion must be the same as Paul's was. Yes. Which is what? A revelation of Jesus Christ in our hearts. Amen. It is very important to understand prophecies. That's what brought me into the church. I was fascinated by the prophecies of Daniel 2 and 7. As important as it is to understand prophecies, it is very important for us to understand that it's impossible to fall in love with Jesus by understanding the prophecies. And that is the purpose of conversion. That is the question when we are converted. Why have I chosen to become a member, say, of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? I was also convinced that Saturday was the correct day to go to church. So, when I was told <clears throat> that I needed to be baptized and then join the Seventh-day Adventist Church or I was going to burn in hell because Jesus is coming soon. I said, whoa, okay, all right, I'll do it. It didn't take long before I realized that understanding the prophecies as I did, and I did, when it came to dealing with personal issues in my life, understanding Daniel 2 and 7 was not helping me a great deal. So that's the dilemma that I faced. How are we saved? By grace alone, faith alone. What did we learn about the definition of grace two Sabbaths ago? This is the definition from the dictionary, okay? The concordance, not what you may have heard. The divine influence upon the heart, that's the first part. What's the second part? Reflecting. And the reflection in the light. 
That is word for word the definition of grace from the concordance. So, <clears throat> when we're saved, when we understand how we are saved, is that important? To understand how we are saved. Yes. It is a heart response to what you have learned was involved in saving you. It's a heart response. Not intellectual alone, but it's a heart response. Let's take a look at John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. It is crucial in understanding chapter 1 of Galatians to understand how we are saved because that's exactly what Paul was trying to teach these churches that he raised in what we know today as southern Turkey, approximately half a dozen churches. Who would like to read 1 John chapter 2 verse 27? Okay, Linda? But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and it is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Thank you. Does this do away with the human participation in the process of proclaiming the gospel? What do we learn from 1 Corinthians 12, 28? Let's take a quick look at that. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Let's take a look at it. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. Who would like to volunteer to read that for us? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. Over here, Patty. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, and the gifts of healings, helps, administrators, administration, priorities, and strength. Thank you. God is very organized, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. And according to our talents or the specific mission that he has for an individual, he calls that individual, and if that individual responds, then we have the Holy Spirit working through that individual to accomplish the task that God has given that individual to perform. Do we understand that? Okay. Now, when anyone cites the name of a highly esteemed scholar to support their opinion or speculation, you may be 100% sure that that person referencing this scholar that they may be very impressed with does not understand, believe what they're talking about or writing about. It is our privilege to understand directly from Scripture and from an apostle or a teacher if they are proclaiming the Word of God exactly what it is that God wants for us to understand about that. Let's turn to John 8, 31 and 32. John chapter 8, 31 and 32. It took me a long time to realize that those that reference experts, scholars, theologians, to support what they are saying or teaching, do not know, understand, or believe what they're talking about. It took me a long time to connect those two. Hopefully, you can make that connection sooner than I did. Who would like to read John 8, 31 and 32? Volunteer. Over here, Regina. Then he said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Thank you. The word free in Greek means liberated. You 
shall be what? Liberated. Liberated from what? Huh? What did Jesus say to the people in uh, Matthew... Uh, as I'm looking for it, I want to make sure that I verify it. Matthew uh, 11. Matthew 11, 28. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest from what? Is he talking about physical rest? No. no. What kind of rest is he talking about? Spiritual rest. Yes. Right. And the confusion and the, of the Lord. and the deceitfulness that they have been taught by whom? <laughs> Scholars and teachers. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I showed you two weeks ago a book that had been written. Yes. This should be an eye open for you. The title of the book was Who's Got the Truth? A one on one interview with five scholars, authors, pastors in good standing in the Seventh day Adventist Church. Only two of them that I'm aware of believe that Jesus took upon his sin, sinless divine nature my sinful nature. Only two. And I personally believe that until you recognize and accept that Jesus had to take, and that's a key word, T-O-O-K, took or T-A-K-E, he had to take ethically and legally, he had to take on at the Incarnation, my sinful nature, it is impossible for him to have saved the human race as the Bible teaches he did. Now this is a personal matter between you and God, you know, whether you believe this or not. But I don't see how in the world any member of the human race would be willing to surrender their life to Christ if Christ did not identify with them at the Incarnation. Yeah. How do we deal with Jesus saying to me, Chuck, I want for you to overcome the way that I overcame? And I say, wait a minute, time out. You didn't identify with me at the incarnation. You didn't take on the equipment that I have to deal with reality every day. And you're asking me to overcome the way you did? Sure. So it's crucial that we deal with that. And it's an individual thing. We have to respect everyone's right to believe whatever they choose. But this is the master deception of Satan. That Jesus did not identify with me at the incarnation. Mm -hmm. Rick? Uh, the Old Testament teaches that one man can't die for another man's sin. Right. So we have a problem there if Jesus didn't become me or us. He couldn't die for another man's sin unless he became me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's critical and crucial to understand that. Mm -hmm. And it is that issue in an indirect way that is causing the problems in Galatia. Okay, so Jesus says he will liberate me because his word will make me what? Liberated. Let's take a look at uh, 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Who would like to volunteer to read that for us? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Okay, Mary Jane. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth, and be turned aside to fables. Thank you. At some point in your life, you have to decide whether this thing that we call a Bible is inspired or not. At some point, you have to make that decision. You have to decide whether a thus, it's a thus saith the Lord or is a thus saith some well-meaning scholar, theologian, pastor, okay? When you choose to accept a biblical truth, 10,000 times 10,000 scholars' approval will not add one Feathers' weight of credibility. Amen. 
to that biblical truth. So the expression in verse 12, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ, is a very relevant statement that we must each deal with. Paul's message is not simply a revelation of Jesus Christ, but rather it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that is something that you have to deal with personally as you study the <clears throat> your Bible, and ask God for the understanding that He wants for you to experience in this time that you choose to spend with Him. The same author, Paul, author of the book of Galatians, also wrote a letter to the Colossians. Let's take a look at Colossians. It's to the right of Galatians. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. This revelation of Jesus Christ in you is the key thought that we're exploring this morning. Who would like to read Colossians chapter 1, verses 25, 26, and 27? Volunteer. Over here, Tom. Of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit that I might fully carry out the preaching of the Word of God. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints, to whom God willing to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Thank you. Why is Paul referencing past ages? All he has to deal with is what? The Old Testament. Why is he referencing them? After 430 years of slavery in Egypt, what did God do? He fulfilled his promise to Abraham. And he brought them out of what? Yeah. And what does he say to them at Mount Sinai? I want for you to... And what? Cherish, guard, keep, protect, appreciate my promises to you. What do the people say? No problem. Exodus 19.8. All that you have said, we will what? And the word in Hebrew is accomplish. <laughs> what happened then? They sent spies into the land and they came back and said, what? No way can we conquer these people. So God said, okay. I misjudge you. Go out for a hike for 40 years. After 40 years, they came back. And then what happened when they entered the land of Canaan? Are you familiar with the book of Judges? Oh, you, should need, you need some Kleenexes next to you when you read Judges because you're going to cry. Then what happened after that? Well, we go into the time of Solomon, and after Solomon, then we have what? We have the minor prophets come into the picture. Why? Because God is preparing His people to be what? Missionaries. But what do the people say? No, 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 no. We want to be like everybody else. To begin with, we need a king. We want to be cool. Oh, that's a word my wife said we don't use it Because it takes. We want to be like everybody else. Then what happens? When Jesus arrives, what do they do? They waited for him for over a thousand years. What did they do? This guy cannot be the Messiah. He doesn't act, look, or talk like we perceive the Messiah should be looking like us. So, they crucify him. So that is what Paul is referencing here. Christ in where? The hope of glory. It's never happened yet to a generation of people. Oh, sure, a few people individually. But to a generation of people, it has not happened at this point in time. That is exactly what Paul is saying here. Now, does Jesus force himself on anyone? No. You're going to heaven whether you like it or not. Does Jesus do that? No. So, I want to introduce you to an idea that's biblical, and that is the two phases of salvation. Okay? Keep your finger on Colossians chapter 1, and go to your left to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. 
1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. We're going to look at the two phases of salvation. This is the first phase of salvation. What we just read in Colossians is the second phase. I'm going to read it because there are a lot of interruptions here. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. When you're there, say ready, and I will read verse 30 for you. Okay. Ready? Here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. But by God's doing, 